Today, uh, we wrap up our series, uh, Broken But Not Defeated, and I'm just going to begin by sharing a story. I don't know, maybe, maybe you're aware of this story, or maybe, maybe not, but there's a, a gentleman by the name of uh, Patrick Lawrence, or uh, pa- Patrick Lawler, excuse me, uh, from uh, Breckenridge, Colorado, and um, you can see here this guy, he had a nail in his head. Um, and so a little bit about that, that story is, um, yeah, so this nail got lodged up into his head, a four inch long nail uh, stuck in his brain, uh, an inch and a half into his brain. And you're like, well, how, what, what, there's, what? That, that's weird. Like, there's got to be a story with that, right? For six days, he lived with his nail in his brain and he didn't even know, in his head and he didn't even know it. So the story is this, um, working in January out in, um, in, in Colorado at one of the ski lodges, he was using a nail gun. And those things can be dangerous. Uh, and so he used a nail gun that backfired, that backfired and, and popped him right in the face. And it shot a nail off into the distance and landed in a piece of wood. And he saw that. But what he didn't realize was a second nail had fired right up through the center of his mouth, just missed his eye, got stuck and lodged in his skull. And again, it was, it was uh, protruding an inch and a half. So you wonder what four inches look like. I don't know how well you could see a, a silver nail in this lighting, but a four inch nail in his brain for six days and he didn't even know it was there. So it was six days of um, pain in his mouth. He he tried uh, painkillers, he tried ice cream, he tried cold packs, um, and after six days of nothing uh, taking away the pain, his wife finally convinced him, you need to go to the dentist. He thought he had a bad toothache. And his wife is a dental hygienist, and, and so she was able to get him in to see the, the dentist, and upon doing an x-ray, the dentist came out and... <laughs> They thought he was joking when, when, they said, when he said, you got a nail in your head. Um, and uh, he said, you got to get to the hospital right away. And so um, four-hour surgery to remove this nail at a Denver hospital, um, but, but got, it, got it out. Uh, you can imagine uh, what that must have been like to finally be informed that for these six days, the pain that you were feeling on the inside uh, was the result of something that you were completely unaware of, of what happened, and then how grateful you were to have it surgically removed. And I tell you this story, or I open this message with this story to just simply highlight and illustrate this very important spiritual truth, and that is this, that in life, we may be walking around in life we may be going here and there and doing things in life. We may, we may be living with some kind of pain. There may be some kind of pain that's, that, that's, that's, that, that's living within us, right? The pain that I'm living with, it may be, this is the truth, it may be the consequence of me living a wrong way. So I have some kind of pain that's happening inside of me. I'm not sure why I have the pain, but I have the pain. Something foreign is inside of me. And that is what is causing the pain. So that foreign thing that we're talking about is living the wrong way. It's not living the way that we've been designed to live. It's not living the, the right way in terms of the way that we would interact with others. It's, it's living the wrong way, or to use biblical language or the profound theological word, it is the word sin. And sin is just simply falling short, missing the mark, being off course. It's not living the right way. Sin has this stigma to it, and appropriately so, right? It's a stigma of being something bad. We, we, tend, to, we, we tend to think of it, uh, sin is something we don't want to talk about. It's embarrassing, but it's also, it's like, it's really evil, which, which is true. It really is. But when you look at it, the basic of what sin is, missing the mark, living wrong, then you can begin to understand why it's so bad, why it's something that you don't want to have inside of you. A nail in your head hurts a lot. Sin in your heart, undealt with, 
unconfessed, we're going to see this morning, may be the reason for physical pain that you are dealing with. We're going to learn this from the life of David in Psalm chapter 38. And if you have a Bible, you can go ahead and you can turn there. And while you're turning there, I'm just going to invite you to just kind of think about what it might look like to have sin causing physical pain. If in anger, if an uncontrolled anger, I punch the wall or kick the wall and end up with a bruised foot or a bruised fist, the consequence, that's the consequence of uncontrolled anger. Right? Uncontrolled anger is living the wrong way. I end up with pain in my body. I may have pain in my gut. I may have um, indigestion. I may have uh, ulcers that are, are forming in my stomach and into my esophagus because I worry and I worry and I'm so anxious. Living the wrong way. It's not the way that I'm designed to live. I end up with physical pain, very real pain inside of my body. The root of it is living the wrong way. On and on and on. There's, there's, there's all kinds of examples we could, we, we, we could think about. And, and as we dig into this text and read of David's nails that are in his head, I just invite you to just kind of contemplate your own pain and wonder and reflect. Look inside what might be the cause. Could it be that I've been living the wrong way? There's some kind of sin. Psalm 38 so you see there's a little subscript or a little heading there at the beginning of this psalm. Not all psalms have these little headings, but most of them do. And they're just a little descriptor of who's the author and maybe some context to it. And we see here uh, in Psalm 38, this is, uh, this is a psalm of David. Last week, Psalm 51, again, we looked at sin. Pastor Joe taught us about sin and the emotional effects of sin. Today is the physical effects of sin. David was the author of Psalm 51. David is the author of Psalm 38. You see also here, it's a Psalm of David and it is a petition. Now when we think petition in English, we, we tend to think of request. I'm petitioning, I'm asking, I'm, I'm requesting of you something, but that's not the most accurate and best translation for the Hebrew here. The Hebrew here it simply means to, to call or to recall or to remember, and associated with it is to remember my acts of sin. This is a psalm of David in which he remembers his wrongdoing and the effects of it. That's what that word means. To recall or to remember my sin and the effects of that sin, the consequences of that sin. And so this is what David writes. This is a prayer. O oh Lord, do not rebuke me in your anger or discipline me in your wrath, for your arrows have pierced me and your hand has come down upon me. Because of your wrath, there is no health in my body. My, bo my bones have no soundness because of my sin. My guilt has overwhelmed me like a burden too heavy to bear. My wounds, they fester and are loathsome because of my sinful folly. I am bowed down. I am brought very low. All day long I go about mourning. My back is filled with searing pain, and there is no health in my body. I am feeble and utterly crushed. I groan in anguish of heart. I'm going to jump down to, or and then jumping down to verse nine. And all the long, all my longings lie upon, open before you, O Lord. My sighing is not hidden from you. 
my heart pounds, my strength fails, and even the light has gone from my eyes. Now jumping down to verse 17. For I am about to fall. My pain is ever with me. I confess my iniquity. I am troubled by my sin. David is telling us that he has been living his life with pain. That the pain in his life is the result of him living his life in the wrong way. There's three observations that we can take away from this passage. The first one, just coming right in verse 1 and 2, is that God doesn't like my sin. God doesn't like my sin. It's interesting, the the three words that David uses, we see, uh, I I highlighted them here for us so that you could see them. Um, In the Hebrew, it is three distinct words. In the English, it's two words, uh, uh, anger and wrath. And here's the three words. So the very first word, uh, anger means wrath or anger. It's fury. It's a feeling of strong displeasure and antagonism towards an object often with the focus of having some kind of action or a consequence or a discipline of some sort following that hot anger. The second one, wrath, venom, snake poison, an extension of the heat and burning feeling that one can have when one is emotionally worked up and in strife and in turmoil. And then the last one, your wrath, indignation. God doesn't like sin. And then you you read some of those words and you think about how that looks amongst us as people and you might go, God gets like angry and wrathful and he, he comes at me and he attacks me and he beats me up and and probably what is in your mind really is unrighteous anger, sinful anger, the picture of a father or a boss or a neighbor or somebody, a brother or a sister who in their anger, uncontrolled anger, in their wrath and their rage and their venom come at you in a sinful and a destructive way. But remember, God is, God is holy. God is perfect. He, God... God lives rightly all of the time. And when God gets angry, he doesn't behave in an angry way like we behave in uncontrolled sinful anger. He behaves in right and righteous anger. And his anger, we see in this text, gets acted upon. So he, there is consequences. Right? He, he doesn't like it when things are done the wrong way. We see in the text, there's, there's, there's five different ways in which God comes after or acts upon his anger towards David, right? He, he says that he rebukes or he corrects him. He disciplines or admonishes. He pierces. This is the, the, the image of an arrow going into an animal, and the animal wobbles off and falls over. He comes down upon, it's the idea of an, en- uh, an enemy army pursuing. And then he says, my health, I have no health in my body because of God's response to my sin. God doesn't like sin. Just like your parents don't like it when you sneak out or the principal doesn't like it when you're dishonoring and disrespectful uh, to your, your, your classmates or even to him or herself or the police officer does not like it when you just drive past him. Just ask Scotty Shuffler for all of you PGA Tour golf players, right? 
And there's consequences then, right? So if you are disrespectful to the teacher and you get sent to the principal's office and there's consequences for that, or you do sneak out and there's consequences that your parents do bring upon you and Scotty Shuffler's finding out his consequences for driving past the police officer just to go and play a round of golf. Right? There's consequences. There's consequences. And sometimes those consequences affect us physically. That's what David is saying. Now, what's interesting is we kind of take a look at the second observation. David says it is actually his sin that is causing the physical pain. So when you look carefully at the way that um, he writes his prayer, he says in verse 3, because of your wrath, there's no health in my body. But then, as you keep going, he says, just at the end of the verse, verse 3, it is because of my sin that my bones have no soundness. And then as you roll into the, to the next verse, it is my guilt, my, my, my sinful guilt that's overwhelmed me. And then at the end of verse 5, the wounds that are festering and loathsome is because of my sinful folly. And then down into verse 18, he says he confesses his iniquity and his trouble because of his sin. Right? And so if you count it, it's one, two, three, four, five times in which he says that I am hurting, I am in pain because of my sin, my iniquity, my guilt, my sinful folly. It is because of what I have done. And that's juxtaposed is in juxtaposition to what he says earlier, right? It's because of God's wrath. Now, the, the reason for that, the reason that, that, that David writes like this is you have to understand the Old Testament mind. The Old Testament mind um, understands guilt and sin, or, or, or for example, um, the word here he uses in the text is my guilt, right? The, 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 it is my, my, my guilt that is overwhelming me, um, and, and creating such a burden. This, this word guilt is iniquity or, or, or guilt or punishment for, 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 for my, my wrongdoing. And it, it's, it, it has the sense of, I did something that was wrong, and because of it, there's a consequence with it. So the Old Testament mind always saw consequence following wrongdoing. It, it just, they, they're, they're together, they're married together, they go together. When I do something wrong, when I miss the mark, when I go off course, when I sin, any of the hundred plus ways that the Bible talks about sin, of living off the, off the course, missing the mark, coming up short, any one of those ways, there's a consequence to it. The Old Testament mind always saw the consequence. I did wrong and there's this consequence. I did wrong and there's this consequence. We, we tend to we tend to separate that in, in our, our, our Western mind. We, you know, we do wrong. We ought, so often, there's not consequence that goes with the wrong that I do. Or we don't even realize or see the consequence of the wrong. For me getting mad at you and, and seeing the consequence of, of, of you withdrawing and pulling away because of the way that I treated you. And we think it's your problem because you're, 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 you're pulling back to defend and to protect and we, and we just miss that. We, we, we completely miss it. But there's a, there's a consequence. This is the Old, the Old Testament mind. And, and so David, what David is saying is that my sin is an offense against God. It's, offense, it, it's, it's, an, it, it's, it's living wrong. And as a result of an offense against God and living wrong, there's a consequence that goes with it. And, and so God is connected to this. Right? Because God has consequences. God doesn't like it when, we, when, when, when things go wrong. I mean, just... Just think about your own life. You don't like it when things go wrong. It's why this is a ser- why we're in this series, right? We don't like brokenness. That's where brokenness comes from, right? Brokenness is things not living right, things not going right. Think- so we opened this series with, a, with my, my broken pepper shaker, that glass bottle. Right? It was, it was, it's a natural thing that happens when glass hit, hits the floor. It's, it's, it's gravity it, 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 It's gravity to make, right? It's, it's the way it's, it's the way, it, but it's broken, it's not right. And so, so brokenness, brokenness, sin, all this is, 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 is a big mess, but there's a consequence to it. Always there's a consequence to it. And so David isn't blaming God. He never blames God in this text. 
He doesn't say that my pain or my sin is God's fault. He just simply is saying, you know what? God is righteous and just to dole out consequences and punishment for wrongdoing. And we get this as individuals who are in a position of authority when we have somebody underneath us who doesn't do what they're supposed to do. You get angry and frustrated as a parent because your child does not behave. And in right, you can, in righteous anger, correct your child. And in righteously, rightly, do it in a right way. You can also, in a very sinful way, discipline and correct your child. But the, but the point is, is that as somebody in a position of authority, you, you get this. You, you, you get righteous anger and the consequences that go with it. It's just that we don't like to be on that receiving end of getting the consequences, right? Or to even reflect and to consider that I, I, the way that I'm living, the wrong way that I'm living deserves this kind of consequence. Okay, so God doesn't like my sin. We said first. Now we're saying my sin can cause physical pain. All right? We'll dig into this for a few minutes. What does it look like for me to experience physical pain because of my sin? You can do a little bit of research on the internet. I don't know if the internet's always correct, but WebMD, and I don't know that WebMD is always correct either, but if you do go to WebMD and you do a little research on the effects of guilt and how guilt affects me uh, as, as a human being, uh, this is what uh, you'll find. Guilt can lead to anxious obsessions, depressive tendencies, and physical symptoms, if not addressed. Some of the physical symptoms of guilt are problems with sleep, your stomach and digestion, muscle, muscle tension. Next slide. Guilt's relationship to other disorders is two-way. It can either cause a disorder or perpetuate one. OCD, obsessive compulsive disorder, right? Um, and depression are two significant others to guilt. OCD is about reoccurring thoughts and actions that are uncontrollable. And guilt can act as a predecessor or an enabler for OCD. I may be having physical symptoms. I mean, this is just exact, this is this is all WebMD is saying. Is you may have physical pain, you may have physical symptoms because of there's 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 something spiritual. There is a nail inside of you that you may not be aware of. There, there's there's something that, that you have done wrong, you've gone wrong, you haven't dealt with the wrong, and as a result, there are physical ailments, there are physical pains that you are experiencing. Okay, this is modern medicine saying this. Now let's look at what David says. Look at the list. There are 14 consequences, physical consequences, that David spells out. He says in verse 2, there is no health in my body. There, my bones have uh, no, no soundness to them. Uh, this is a way of saying my complete body. He says, it's, there's a, I have like this burden Guilt is like this burden. It's so heavy, it's weighing me down. My wounds fester. This is kind of getting at skin diseases um, and, and, and maybe uh, boils or, 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 or something on, on the outside, some scars. I'm, I'm bowed down. Again, this is the weight of my sin. It, 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 it physically has this heavy effect upon. I go about mourning. My back's filled with searing pain. Do you have back pain? But th there's no health in my body. I'm feeble. I'm entirely crushed. I groan in anguish of heart. My heart pounds. I got, I got heart issues, heart palpitations. My strength is failing. My light has gone from my eyes. In other words, I'm, I'm, I can't see right. I'm, and I'm troubled. I'm troubled because of my sin. Now, each one of these physical descriptors, David is associating with his sin. 
saying is because, uh, because I've missed the mark, I've gone off course, because I've been living the wrong way, because I've done what's not right, I have these physical effects in my body. Could it be that the pain that I'm walking around with, that I'm living with today, is because I've been living the wrong way? So I got this, this, this pain inside of my body. It's in there. I'm not aware of it. I don't know why it got there. I don't see it. But it's because, because of my sin. And in particular, unconfessed sin. You know, unconfessed sin. Sin that's kept secret. Things that you know that you've done that are wrong. And, and you know it's wrong. You, you, you knew it was wrong when you did it. You knew it was wrong when you acted on it. You knew it was wrong when you thought about it. You know it was wrong. But you enjoyed it. You appreciated it. And you continue in it. And then it's a secret. It's kept as a secret. You know, there's some, there's a, so, some other interesting um, scientific research that's been done. There's an article, the title of which is Science Predicts You're Hiding 13 Secrets. So social scientists have researched and interviewed people, and um, they, they collected over 13,000 secrets from a whole bunch of people. They categorized them into 38 um, kinds of categories of secrets that people are keeping. So that we as people keep 13, 13 secrets, five of which we've told absolutely nobody ever. And, and here's the, like the categories they categorize them, the things like telling a lie or harming someone, um, drug use, theft, violating someone's trust, sexual infidelity, a secret, uh, a secret hobby, um, and on and on and on. Uh, and, and here's the thing that they d uncovered and discovered about people who maintain these secrets and keep these secrets. Uh, the, 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 the conclusion is that secrets are like this weight that, that weigh us down because nobody else knows it's in the back of our mind and it's there and we're trying to protect it and, and, and keep, it, keep it hidden and it affects us. And so they, they discovered through um, um, very practical hands-on kinds of exercises that people who were in their mind hiding a secret when they participated in these two exercises, one in which was they were to gauge the distance, that something was off uh, out into the distance. They were, it was always like it was way further out there, or they had to throw a bean bag at a, at a target, and they were constantly overthrowing the target as though they, it was like it was too heavy, the bean bag was too heavy, or the distance was so far out there. And so they conclude uh, that people who are living with secrets are carrying a heavy weight on them. They go on and they, and they, and they say that secrets can be harmful both to a person's physical and mental well-being. Previous research has linked secrecy to depression, anxiety, and poor physical health. Could it be that my pain is the result of me keeping things secret, my sin secret. I just want to pause for a second and just make it really clear here. Two weeks ago, the title of the message was Broken by Pain, right? And we're talking today about broken by physical pain, but we're talking today about sin being the reason for my physical pain. Two weeks ago, it wasn't to say that all physical pain, matter of fact, my, maybe most physical pain is not the result of my sin. It's the result of me living in a broken world. And so bad things happen to me. So, so just to be really clear, some of the pain that you may, you may have, you may have stomach issues, you may have back issues, you, you may have uh, a, achy muscle, you may have issues that are the result of physical pain that aren't because of sin, but... But it might be because you have sin. And we, we must consider this. We must consider this. And the secrecy of it has such negative effects. And so we, 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 we said so far this morning, number one, that God doesn't like sin. Secondly, we've said that my sin, I recognize it could be my fault, right? It's my sin that causes 
the physical pain that, that I'm having. But then the third thing to observe in this text is where, where David ends. He, he ends by confessing, right? He ends by revealing. You know that word confess is the exact opposite of the word secret. The word the Hebrew word for confess means to tell or to announce. It's to report. It's to reveal. It's to expose. It's to, it's to proclaim. Confess is to, to make known. It's to make known my sin. David says that he is making known his sin to God. The exact opposite of secret. How good are we at confessing our sin? If you're here today and you're carrying around a nail in your head, got a nail in your head, pain that you're living with, perhaps it's because of sin. But what you need to know is the good news. The good news is this, that when we confess our sin, when we confess our sin, God is faithful and just, and he forgives us of our sin. You know, when you look at scripture and you see what God does to our sin when we confess it, let's put together a list. When I confess my sin, 1 John 1, 9 tells us that God sends it away. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just. He will forgive us of our sins. That word to forgive is connected to the Old Testament priestly activity in which the nation would bring a goat to the high priest and he would figuratively, physically would lay his hand on the goat and figuratively transfer the sin of the entire nation upon that goat. And then the nation would send that goat out into the wilderness to never be seen again. Sent away. Gone. That's what 1 John 1, 9 tells us about our sin when we confess it. This is how God treats it. He sends it away. It's gone forever. Secondly, uh, and this is of David, Psalm 32, 1, when he's confessing his sin, the text that we looked at last week of his sin between Bathsheba and then the murdering of Bathsheba's husband, when he confesses his sin, God says that he lifts off the, 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 the weight of the guilt, this guilt that makes him, and he, 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 he explains it here, right? he, he describes it here as his back being filled with pain and being bent over because of his sin. David in 32, Psalm 32 says that when I confess it, it, it's like the burden just falls off. It just rolls off the back of me and I, I can now stand. I'm released from the guilt of my sin. He goes on in the same text in 32 um, to say that God covers over the sin, whatever that sin is that I did. And it doesn't matter how, 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 how you might define it in terms of being so bad. God says he covers it over covers it over, takes the rug, puts it over the hole on the carpet. Nobody ever sees it again. It's covered over. It's done with. It's gone. Psalm, 130, Psalm 103, 12, um, God removes it forever. This is, uh, this is the, the, the famous psalm of which God um, remembers our sin. You know, he, he sends it from the east as far as from the west, and he doesn't remember. It's like, how far to the east and how far to the west can you go? That's how far your sin is from God. I mean, it goes infinity to the east. It goes to infinity to the west. Your sin, God, God doesn't remember it. It's, it's, it's removed. It's removed from his presence. Isaiah 43 says he blots it out. He deletes it. He takes something, he erases it, he scribbles it over. It, he, it's, it's gone. It's not there anymore. Your sin is completely removed. He says he remembers it no more. In Jeremiah 31, in four, three other places, is the same idea. Remember it. Remember, I, I don't remember your sin. I don't remember your sin. I don't remember your sin. I don't remember it. 
And then lastly, he casts it into, into the depths. It is, it is like a, a, a big anchor that's thrown overboard that gets disconnected and it, it just sinks to the bottom. It's just, it's gone. This is your sin. This is your confessed sin. It's gone. It's removed. And when your sin is confessed and you are clean before God, suddenly the effects of that sin upon your body dissipates and goes away. Now, now maybe not all of it, Maybe not all of my, 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 my consequences are removed. I still may have to endure ongoing painful consequences for my, for my sin, but, 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 it, but the guilt of it, it's covered over. It's covered over. I'll ask our worship team to come on up. And this is how it's covered over, right? It's covered over in Jesus. And so Jesus, a man, the God-man, God in flesh lives a perfect life. Jesus lives a perfect life. He's God in flesh, skin, bones, just like you and I have. He experienced pain, just like you and I experienced pain. But he experienced pain because of the evil that was done to him. And in his death on the cross, he took the guilt of your sin he took the weight of your sin. He took the consequences of your sin. And he says, if you turn to me and you just simply confess it and trust what I did and what, what, what I did and how I did it, th those are mysterious to us for sure. How, how it is that Jesus took my sin, we, we, we can't fully explain all that. But he says he did. If you're here this morning, you've never put your faith in Jesus Christ. You've never confessed your sin. This is the greatest news you could ever receive. To just be forgiven. And for God to look at you and to see Jesus. To see the righteousness and the perfection of who Jesus is. He doesn't see your sin anymore. He blots it out. He deletes it. He covers it over. He removes it. It's gone. You're free. You're free. You're free. This is, the, this is the greatest news. This is the greatest news that we hear, that we can receive. Would you pray with me? God, I, I thank you. I thank you for this series. I thank you for the important things that we have learned about brokenness. Thank you for your word that you address it. You, you don't hide from it. But in fact, you use the brokenness, as we learned a couple weeks ago from C.S. Lewis, as a megaphone to just draw us to yourself as we wrestle with the brokenness in this world. We thank you for this, this last message of, and, and, and the openness of David to just say, oh, my pain is because of my sin. Spirit of God, I ask that you would search our hearts. I ask that in this moment that you would dredge up things that we may have buried and have never confessed. And then we would confess it and release it to you and receive your grace and your forgiveness. Come upon us as your people who call out to you. We ask these things in your name, Jesus. Thank you, Kirk. As you were speaking, I was reminded of Paul speaking to the Romans, explaining his struggle of sin that he deals with, that we all deal with, and says, oh, what a wretched man that I am. Who will deliver me from this body of death? And his response, thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Would you stand and let's, let's celebrate the grace that God has given us.